When the Spirit came, Peter said that your young men will have visions, your old men will have dreams, your sons and daughters will prophesy. And so very consistent with the Holy Spirit who spoke then, still speaking today. By the providence of God, your friend had a dream. Can I exegete meaning into that or use it as a basis for my own experience or teach it as a methodology for others? I don't think that that's appropriate. Well, hello and welcome along to today's show. We're talking about whether God speaks today through dreams, visions and prophecy. Excited about today's show. But if you're new to the channel, do make sure to like the video, subscribe and you can even get our regular newsletter, bonus content and much more by signing up with the link with today's show. Well, Tanya Harris joins me today. She's the founding director of God Conversations, a global ministry that she says equips people to recognize and respond to God's voice. Tanya is the author of The Church Who Hears God's Voice, a book that tells how she and many others have experienced divine support, guidance and encouragement through dreams, visions and prophecy. But cessationists say that we no longer require such ways to hear from God. The Bible is the only way we hear from God now and that believing that we can hear God speak through other means is false and often dangerous. Well, Jim Osman is the author of God Doesn't Whisper, which examines the assumptions, practices and proof texts of those who promote a theology of hearing the voice of God. So we'll be debating whether or not God speaks to people today through dreams, visions and prophecy. Tanya and Jim, welcome along to the show. Thank you. Great to be here, Justin. Well, it's great to have you both. And I appreciate you both making this work from all three different time zones that we're in in the world. Tanya, you're over in Australia. It's lovely to, to be speaking to someone down under today. Tell us tell us a bit of your background, though, because you I don't think you grew up in a in a church background that was really into signs and wonders or God speaking in these ways, were you? Definitely not. I grew up in a good church, actually. It was a, lots of beautiful people, but I hit the age of 21 and hit a bit of a crossroads and wondered if the faith of my parents should be taken on by myself. And I met a friend and she had a very lively relationship with God and she talked about God speaking to her. And I thought that was a very novel thing. I was very curious and I thought, I wonder what it would be like to, you know, hear God's voice. What would God speak to me about? Mm. Um, in my tradition, we had been taught that God only speaks through scripture. So I prayed a prayer and I said, God, could you speak to me? And if you do, can you make it really clear? Because I've seen the way you speak to people in scripture. I've heard and read all of their stories, but I want it to be clear. And if you make it clear, I'll do whatever you say. <laughs> and the story goes that God did speak. He made it really clear. And um, I did what God said eventually. And life turned out to be very different than I had imagined. I uh, started out my working career as a school teacher. And at the age of 26, God called me into ministry. I was involved in lots of different types of ministry, um, church planting, Bible college lecturing, mission work, youth work. Uh, and then later on, God said, Tanya, your call in life is to take everything that I have taught you about hearing my voice and pass it on to other people. And about 15 years ago, the Ministry of God Conversations was born. And so that's what I do today full time. I'm traveling and speaking and broadcasting around the topic, helping people to hear the voice of the Spirit for themselves. I mean, it trips off the tongue when you say it, you know, God told me to do this and God told me to do that. What what does that actually look like in practice? You know, if, if you were to give an example of, of God speaking to you in, in this kind of way? <laughs> Yeah, that was exactly my question, Justin. I remember going up to people and they would say, God spoke to me. I'm like, well, what was that like? Can you, can you, can you tell me how did that feel? And I think for me, I'm such an analytical person, such a cerebral person. It didn't come sen in, a, in sensory ways for me. Um, so that's when it had to be very clear. And I, I guess I kept coming back to the narratives of scripture and, and such seeing how my experience uh, fit in with that. And so I found that God spoke to me through the traditional ways, um, obviously through when the spirit speaks to us, um, when we read the Bible, and obviously when people are teaching and preaching the scriptures, um, but also outside of that by the spirit, a very spiritual voice that would speak in words or in pictures or in senses. Um, and again, tried to see, I could see those parallels in scripture, particularly about those methods that I, that I experienced in my own life. Well, we'll, we'll obviously come back to some of this, uh, Tanya, um, and I'm sure Jim will have plenty to say about it because in a way, Jim, when I started reading your book, I realized this is basically the polar opposite of Tanya's book. <laughs> yeah, uh, so this it is, is 
this this is a great matchup for unbelievable we like bringing people with very different perspectives on for this um tell us tell us then because in a way you you did grow up in an environment where people were very open to hearing from god in in various ways and you start your own book by explaining how you just got absolutely disillusioned because other people said they were hearing from god and and you had this experience at college of not hearing from god in the way that they claim to be so so tell us a bit about your experience then yeah i didn't grow up in a church going home and uh, i wasn't um part of a church in my early years of of growing up and I didn't, I didn't start going to or attend a church that was charismatic in any way. It was non-charismatic church. But the Bible college that I went to had a theology that was kind of latent in the student body that adopted more charismatic views, not only of hearing the voice of God, but also of some spiritual warfare techniques that I had adopted as a brand new believer. And uh, that's where I was exposed to some of this. I heard students in the student body talking about God revealed this and he spoke to me and I put out a fleece and I, you know, a verse jumped off the page and, and all of these experiences. And, and I was desperate and begging for some kind of an experience to give me some clear direction in life. And, and I didn't hear the voice of God. I had nothing that I could say was the supernatural voice of God. And maybe for me, I was, I was expecting something that would be clear, something that would be audible, something that would be unmistakable, but I never had any experience that I couldn't explain away by just a matter of coincidence or, or an idea that would pop into my own mind. And I thought, certainly this cannot be the voice of God, just a random thought that pops into my head. Uh, if God is truly speaking, then it will be absolutely clear who it is and it will come with authority and, and it will be something akin to what we see in scripture. And yet when I started to ask some of my Bible college friends about what they were experiencing, I thought, but, but this is not what is revealed in scripture when God speaks. So yeah, that was my background. And, and I do agree that, um, that my book is in many ways the polar opposite of Tanya's because uh, after I got done reading her book here just a couple of days ago, I said to my wife, if you, if you were going to write a book that would try to answer the arguments that I make in my book and be a, a serious theological attempt to do so without citing my book, like if somebody were commissioned to write a book that is an answer to mine without mentioning my book title, this is it. Because I, I felt that there was just almost a direct, you know, one-to-one -one correspondence between the arguments we were making, the issues that we were raising, mm. and both of us approaching those same issues from two different perspectives. So I, I do think it is a good a good match. Okay, well, that's great. And, and uh, I just encourage you guys to obviously speak to each other directly as we go on in, in the show just before though we, we leap into the the specific issues i mean it, this recording comes sort of hot on the heels of this this outbreak of what people are calling the asbury revival i'm sure you've both seen it in your timelines and and it's just an interesting fact that that we're having this conversation in the midst of this outpouring uh, as it's called um in uh, asbury university in kentucky um thousands of people turning out to this chapel to sort of have you know a kind of experience of god and and lots of people are talking about feeling god experiencing god in a new way um there's repentance there's you know people who who say that their lives are being turned around through this whole thing uh tanya what's your thoughts on that that outpouring and, and what's going on at asbury I think it's wonderful. <laughs> Anything that calls people to worship and repentance um, is a beautiful thing. And it's not to say that Holy Spirit isn't moving in other places at other times, but sometimes there seems to be in history an intensifying of, of what God is doing. And, you know, I have a friend uh, down in Melbourne whose church is experiencing that at the moment as well. Another one in the UK who works in Africa who's seeing a beautiful move of the Spirit and seeing all the uh, signs of God working as we see in the early church of scripture. I think it's, I think it's wonderful. Bring it on. Jim. Well, I have quite a different take on it. I, uh, I thought to, you say might. That I'm, <laughs> to say that I'm skeptical would be an understatement for sure. Uh, I think one of the issues that I have there is that it's, it's well known that there are uh, gay affirming queer and LGBTQ students who are very progressive in their views of Christianity who are involved in leading the worship and in organizing and orchestrating this whole thing. So I would love to see people called to repentance, but if such a quote unquote revival, and I'll, I'll just use that term because that's what it's being described as, if this kind of revival does not produce that kind of repentance from things that God regards to be an abomination, then it's no true revival at all. Uh, I haven't watched a great deal of it. I haven't heard the messages that are being preached, but I think that, um, I, don't, I don't think that, the hyper-emotional experience by a bunch of college students constitutes a revival. Uh, 
So we will see what the, whether the fruit of this is good or bad. If they're, if they're, it's very easy to, to conjure up emotional experiences with music. Music can be used to manipulate people. And just because people are spending a long time singing, a long time worshiping, that's not necessarily what I would say is a revival. I think that there needs to be a return to the Word of God, a calling people to the true gospel and repentance from sin and a belief in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. So Asbury has a history of, of having these earth-shaking revivals, and they're very known for their emotionalism, and there are people at the school who are very affirming of sinful lifestyles, and if that doesn't change, and those are the people in charge of it, this is not a work of God. Well, I don't want to take up the whole conversation with, with debating the Asbury revival, because, um, in fact, we did that last week um, on the show, um, so anyone who wants to hear more on the Asbury revival, check out last week's Unbelievable Show. But, um, Without maybe going into the details of Asbury per se, Tanya, I think that charge that Jim levels there of emotionalism um, is is part of the issue here for many people who are suspicious of people hearing from God because it's so subjective. And that's the word Jim uses often in his book. Um, so, so where do you start with that? The fact that obviously a lot of people just say people claiming they're hearing from God, whether it be in their head or through some picture or, or through some coincidence in their life it's it's inevitably going to be very subjective and you can't rely on that. Well, uh, subjectivity is an interesting descriptor, I think, because the spirit works in individual hearts to transform us, which is a subjective experience. I think the test of whether God is at work is what Jim has said is the fruit of that, isn't it? And so we see Holy Spirit moving in the book of Acts in subjective ways. Holy Spirit is speaking to Philip, to Stephen, to Paul, to Agabus. And so what Holy Spirit is saying and the outcomes of that is the true measure. And the real question is, well, is the Spirit speaking as the continuing voice of Jesus? Because Jesus said, when I leave, I'm going to send you my Spirit and my Spirit's going to continue to do what I've been doing. My Spirit's going to remind you of everything that I have established. And then I have so much more to tell you, but you can't handle it all right now, but I'm gonna send you my spirit and my spirit's going to speak about things to come. My spirit's gonna take the truths that I have established, the truths recorded for us as scripture and apply it to your individual context, wherever you go, wherever you are. And it will be better if I leave. But I think the really important thing to understand is that wherever the spirit moves, it's going to continue the ministry and mission of Jesus. And to be honest, I think that's the standard of discernment um, that we need to apply. And so when the spirit moves, it will look a bit different in individual lives. I found that the spirit convicts people of different things at different times. I remember for me personally, when I first started listening to the Holy Spirit in this way, God spoke to me about my money. <laughs> And um, how did I know it was God? Um, how was it not just a voice in my head? Um, it was because it was the opposite of what I wanted to hear. And God was really dealing with my reliance on finances and my love of money and was asking me to give it away. And um, again, what fruit does that produce in someone's life? Well, it needs to produce the fruit of Jesus. It needs to produce someone who's more generous and more kind and more giving to other people. And I think if we apply that standard, then our experiences are subjective in that sense, but they have a, a external discernment around them that is set by the boundaries of Jesus. Hmm. I mean, Jim, d d firstly, I, I just wonder, what is your theology of the spirit? What, you know, presumably you obviously believe that as a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit but you don't believe that the spirit speaks to you in the way that Tanya obviously does? Well, part of our disagreement here is gonna come down to how we define things because I found as I was reading through Tanya's book that you include, Tanya, a lot of, of references to the works of the spirit. You classify them under the spirit speaking um, or revealing things, whereas I would use what I think is more biblical language of, I feel convicted. I would never say the Spirit spoke to me about my love of money. I would say I was convicted by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God concerning a sin in my life. That's the language that I would use to describe that. Because when you say speaks, you're communicate. You're saying you're saying something about the nature of what is being done by the Spirit, namely revelation, as if He's revealing something new. 
Whereas I would use terms like illumination, conviction, encouragement, strengthening, um, and, and I do sense and feel the presence of the Spirit of God very palpably at times in my life. It's not all the time the same. You know, when I'm out working in my garden and my mind is thinking about a sermon or my mind is thinking about dirt or whatever, I'm not, I'm not in tune with the Spirit at that point. And other times when I'm reading the Word of God and things are are coming together in a sermon and I feel a conviction in my own heart, I can sense the Spirit of God working there and there is a subjective element to that. But I, I would never say the Spirit the Spirit is spoke to me and told me this um, because that, that communicates revelation. When my wife gives me a hug, I sense or feel her love. But when she says, I love you, that she's telling me that she loves me, that's different than hugging me. Both are expressions, but I wouldn't say my wife told me that she loved me when she hugged me. You know what I mean? Mm. So when I when I when the Spirit of God does convict me, I don't use the words that communicate the idea of revelation to describe that work of the Spirit. It's interesting, I think, um, and I, I think this is an interesting one, Jim, and I actually really liked your book because you picked up on some some gaps in the theology around this area that I myself observed, and I really appreciate some of the, the insights that you had around that and the way that you um, approached that so carefully. But one of the interesting things about this area is we talk about hearing God's voice, and that's just one of the senses, hearing. But actually, communication is much broader than that, and you've just highlighted that it's not always in words there's a sensory element there and so for you how did you feel for example when you were convicted about something that in itself for me at least from a broad brush of communication it is is a form of communication when your wife hugs you she is sending a message without words and I think the spirit does that too and we need to broaden it out our language of hearing is perhaps a little bit limiting in that sense. I was um, chatting with a young Christian recently about how the spirit communicates, how the spirit speaks. And he said, oh, it's, you know, I was talking about God speaks in all through our senses, the spirit speaks to us. And he said how he had, you know, came to some friends, some old mates of his, and they were all talking and suddenly the topic changed into some unsavory stuff. And suddenly he said, I felt really uncomfortable, like really disturbed, and I felt like I should walk away. And he said, but the interesting thing was that before I became a Christian, I didn't feel like that. And I said, that's that's the spirit. That's the spirit communicating. Now, it wasn't in words, but the spirit was saying, hey, I don't want you to think on these things. I want you to think what is true and lovely and kind. And so God communicates, I think, in a multifaceted way using all of the senses. Holy Spirit is incredibly incarnational and gets the message across in whatever way is effective. And in the same way that your wife gives you a hug, she's communicating love without even saying it, but you feel it. So you know that it's you've received that communication. And so perhaps, you know, our language isn't so helpful there when we talk about is, 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 is that a form of communication that you'd be willing to say yes maybe that is you know the uh, interesting story tanya told there this this guy who felt uncomfortable um around those friends uh, acting in that way is would you ascribe that to the the, the a communication as it were from the spirit jim I, I wouldn't call that the voice of god or communication because what you said tanya was that the spirit spoke to him and it wasn't in words but the spirit said and then you you could put quotations around what you said the spirit was saying to him and you used words so i i think that i think that that lack i think that the looseness of the language is itself contributing to the lack of clarity i would say he was convicted the spirit of god in him was reacting to now because he has a new nature he is reacting to sin in a different way than he what did before because he now is a new creation in Christ. So he has a different view of sin and awareness of sin and aliveness of his spirit that was not there prior to that. But I wouldn't say the spirit spoke to him and said, hey, you need to be thinking more about things that are positive. That, see, that just, that just lumps everything that the spirit of God does into this venue of communication and, and speaking. And, and that's where that's where part of the issue is here because you're you're claiming to receive divine revelation whereas the Spirit of God does so much more than that he convicts he comforts he encourages he strengthens he gifts he equips etc um, and I prefer to use the biblical terms I mean obviously you know th th there are obviously more direct ways in which you do believe the spirit speaks you know in ways that are auditory or, or at least with you know someone believes they are hearing real words from God 
uh, via the spirit, Tanya. So what what I mean, could you give us an example or two um, and why you believe that this is consistent with what the Bible teaches and, and isn't something that was simply for the time of the apostles and so on? Can I give you a biblical example and a contemporary one? Is that OK? Sure. I think of, um, and we talk about speaking again, and so much of spirit revelation in scripture is visual, and it's a really powerful way to communicate. So I love that scene in the book of Revelation where John is taken up into the throne room of heaven, and the question is asked, who can open the scroll that's in the hand, the right hand of the one who sits upon the throne? And the angel says, can we find anyone? And there's no one to be found. And finally, he says, there's the lion of the tribe of Judah, which you know is a messianic term for the Messiah. It was long awaited. And so it would have conjured up ideas of ferocity and, and the great mighty king. And then what happens is the scene shifts and the spotlight turns onto a little lamb who is small and fragile. It looks like it's been slain. <laughs> this is the lion. This is the ferocious beast. And the lamb has seven eyes, eyes of perfect vision, has seven horns. Strength is the, the symbol of ancient horns in the ancient world. And so this picture is communicating something even without words. Now, obviously, it's then written down as words, but the impact of that is so powerful. The communication is still there. And God was speaking to John and the seven churches about how to deal with the problems and the issues they were facing under the first century Greco-Roman Empire. But it's a, it's a Holy Spirit word that comes as a visual. And so it's broader than words because the impact um, is often even more impacting because of the visuals. Um, there was um, a guy that in Australia who was suffering a drought um, in, in the Australian drought a few years ago. And he, like many other farmers, was suffering the effects of it and facing potential bankruptcy. And he prayed and soon afterwards he had a dream and he saw the paddock in the northeast corner of his farm and it was planted with canola seed and the plants had come up to about 15, 20 centimetres high. And he woke up thinking, wouldn't that be good if it was true? My field is barren, there's been no rain, the crops are dying and, and all over Australia farmers are depressed and committing suicide. And as he prayed about it with his wife, he realized that God was speaking to him, again, visually without words. And he made the choice, they made the choice to invest in a thousand kilos of canola seed, a, a crop they'd never planted before. And then they began to sow through the night for three days. And on the third day, the rains came and they took root, the canola took root and grew up and they flourished to the height that he'd seen in the dream. He took that seed to market, he took that plant to market and it covered 80% of his annual income. And there was a miracle that he saw in saving his farm. And again, the message of God came through a dream, very similar to the way that it came in the New Testament that we see from Acts 2. You know, when the spirit came, Peter said that your young men will have visions, your old men will have dreams, your sons and daughters will prophesy. And so very consistent with the Holy Spirit who spoke then, still speaking today to help us mm. as we go in our way following Jesus. I mean, that, that's a great contemporary example there, Jim, and obviously linking to the example of, of dreams and visions in Scripture. And of course, there are many other examples Tanya could have pointed to in the Old Testament as well. So, so why for you? Uh, should we not necessarily put our trust in those kinds of um, again, it's not speaking per se, because, again, it's a visual thing. But 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 it, it, I guess under the broad um, concept of communication, uh, that, that that that's what it is. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the issues that we face with this is um, Tanya can give examples of people who acted upon a dream or an idea or a thought that popped into their head and it worked out well. Um, you could also tell stories of people who did the exact same thing and it was tragic. And so how do I, I what, what we are not told of in scripture is that we should expect these things or act upon them. We are never encouraged to seek after visions and dreams. In fact, we are warned about such things in scripture. Paul talks about people being puffed up and, and acting on dreams and visions in the book of Colossians. Instead, we are told to go to the word of God and to walk in wisdom and use the word of God as the guide and the rule for doing that. So we're not encouraged in scripture to search for dreams or to ask for dreams or visions or even to act upon them. And we're never told in scripture, how, how do I know that 
how do I know that something is the voice of God and something is, is not just my own conjured up imagination or something that pops into my head in a, in a dreamy state? Scripture doesn't give us any guidelines for discerning that or, or what, exegeting What do you it. do with, with that Acts 2 then where, where uh, you know, it does say in the final days, you know, young men, visions, dreams, old men and so on. What, what, what do you say to those kinds of verses? Well, Peter is quoting Joel chapter 2, which is a prophecy of the end times, even after the times in which we're living now, prior to the, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ that Joel speaks of. At the beginning of chapter 3, he speaks of the judgment that will happen in, in the valley of Megiddo and the end times judgment, the cataclysmic judgment at the end. So I think that what Peter is doing there is Joel, Joel 2 describes the outpouring of the Spirit of God, which, which happened at Pentecost, and some of the effects of that described in Joel were present there. Uh, but not everything that Joel described was present there. The moon turning to blood and all of the, the eschatological phenomena did not happen at the day of Pentecost. So I do believe that there will come a time in the future, in the millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, when the Spirit of God will be working in those ways. But in the church age right now, I don't believe that that prophecy... So, so in, in a sense, you do think there will be a time when people do dream dreams and have visions that are from God, just not now, essentially. Just, it's, it's, I don't think that it's something that is for the current church age. I, right. I think that that is something that is going to happen in the millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll go to a quick break and I'll get you back, straight back, Tanya, to, to respond as well. Interesting stuff today on the show, asking, does God speak today through dreams, visions and prophecy? We'll maybe get to talk about some prophecy as well in the course of the rest of the programme. But uh, my guests are Jim Osman and Tanya Harris, and we'll be back in just a moment. Two thirds of people believe that science and religion are incompatible, according to a recent UK survey. Many of the key atheist voices in our culture have used science as a battering ram against Christian belief. But there's a different story to be told about science and faith, and few people better to tell it than John Lennox, Emeritus Professor of Mathematics and Philosophy of Science at the University of Oxford. I'm Justin Briley, and in this new online course from Premier Unbelievable on science, faith and the evidence for God, you're invited to learn from one of the most celebrated Christian thinkers of our time as I open up the conversations I've hosted between John Lennox and atheist thinker Michael Roos and secular talk show host Dave Rubin. Across nine modules, you'll discover how Christianity grounds the evidence for God, why it led to the rise of modern science, what response we can give to the question of evil, whether miracles are anti-scientific and why atheism and science can't account for human value or the biggest questions our culture is asking. As well as my guide to these top flight conversations, the course includes supplementary video material from lectures delivered by John Lennox on God, faith and science, along with questions and assignments to help you ground the various learning points in each module. You can take the course at your own speed and in your own time. Enroll now at the link with this video and learn how to make sense of science, Christianity and secular culture. Welcome back to the show. Um, does God speak today through dreams, visions and prophecy? That's our subject. Uh, Tanya Harris, founding director of God Conversations and author of books, including The Church Who Hears God's Voice, is with me very much in favour of the idea that, yes, people absolutely do and should hear from God in all kinds of ways today. Um, but sceptical of that, Jim Osman, also on the programme, author of God Doesn't Whisper, says we have the Bible. That's the way in which God communicates to us. And uh, it's too subjective. The rest of it, you know, um, Tanya, the, you know, you quoted something that worked out well, says Jim. Um, but there's plenty of times people have think they've heard from God. They do something and they fall flat yeah. on their face. So so is is it that kind of selection bias going on there? And I'd be interested in your response to his interpretation of, of that chapter of Acts as well. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why I did a PhD on this topic, Justin, because I heard the good stories, but I've also heard the bad. You don't have to look very far to find some pretty bad stories. And history is also full of them. None of the problems are new. But I, I said before, Jim, what I liked about your book is the issue of discernment. And I think that in our theological frameworks, we haven't had a robust 
system of discernment. We've tended to jump to First Corinthians and is a, a prophetic word, is it strengthening, encouraging or comforting, which could be anything really, couldn't it? Um, instead of understanding that the Spirit speaks as the continuing voice of Jesus, the living Word of God in the flesh. So that has to be our standard to begin with. And I think that's what we see as well throughout the New Testament. We do see a rigorous process of uh, the Spirit speaking to the early church. So I think as we look through the book of Acts, um, John Miller, biblical scholar, has counted about 20 different instances of visions and dreams where the Spirit is speaking to the early church. And one of the one of the, probably one of the pivotal ones, I think, which forms an excellent model for our own discernment, because I've seen this outplay also in contemporary situations, is the God conversation in Acts chapter 10 with Peter on the rooftop. And if you think about that story, this is the, this is the message where the Spirit speaks about bringing the Gentiles into the church, which was primarily Jewish at that time. And Peter's on his rooftop and he's praying. I imagine he's praying about his commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Um, it's just before lunch and he falls into a trance. He falls asleep and he starts dreaming of food. <laughs> and I think to myself, now that message carried such a key message for the church that God was saying the Gentiles are to be embraced with the gospel as well. But he used a visionary experience, a subjective visionary experience to do it. But then when you have a look at that that narrative and perhaps Jim, you know, I think um, as I've investigated this, it would be so nice if there was a nice set of instructions that were nice and clear like this. But what we do have is narrative. What we do have is story after story after story. And Peter, what we see as, as Peter, he's had his vision and it's not clear at first because after all, it contradicted all of the Jewish teaching. It contradicted the law of Moses. It contradicted every custom and culture he had had not to hang out with Gentiles or eat non-kosher food. Um, and he's wondering about the meaning of the vision. Was that from God? You know, the voice, it, it came from heaven, but would God say that, that it's okay? What, what, what we've called unclean is now clean. And just as that's happening, the, the exact moment, there's a greeting outside the home and it's the sound of Romans, of Gentiles. And as he goes down to greet them, I imagine that the same repulsive feeling he had when he saw the unclean food would have turned his stomach. They're inviting him over to his house and everything in him says, no, they're unclean. And the penny drops. And what we see in the New Testament pattern is that the beauty of the new covenant is, see back under the old covenant, you only had the prophets primarily hearing God's voice. They were like the, the lone voice in the wilderness calling out. And yeah, there was a system of testing in place, but it wasn't always foolproof in lots of ways. But now you get sons and daughters, young and old, with the capacity to hear God's voice in the same way as the old covenant prophets, which means that God can speak more than once. And so what we see here is that at exactly the right moment where Peter's having his vision, Cornelius over in Caesarea, a day's walk away, is hearing God speak and God brings them together. And it's like, well, Peter, what did you see? Cornelius, what did you hear? And they have a conversation and they see that God is speaking twice. And I think that that element of testing and discernment in community has often been lost. You know, we have the, God told me this, but we need to understand that the Spirit speaks to more than one. And we see an agreement in the Spirit. And later on, of course, the Jerusalem Council discusses this. Um, as a body because it affects mm. a much wider sphere than those individuals. Well, and well, I'll, I'll and come back to Jim for, yeah. for, for some commentary on that. I, I'd be interested as well in, in your view on Jim's interpretation there of, of that chapter where, where Peter talks about young men dream dreams, old men have visions and so on. What, what, Jim sees that as, as being something for the end of the age, not for the church age. What's, what's your view on that, Tanya? Yeah, it's interesting. I was wondering about that, Jim, because Acts chapter 2 is um, doesn't find its mention very often in, in the teaching on hearing God's voice. And um, I think that for me, when, you, when we say the Spirit's being poured out on everyone here, your young men and your old men will have visions and dreams, your, your sons and daughters will prophesy. 
I think it's a very clear reference to the main way that the Old Covenant prophets heard from God, primarily through visions and dreams. We see that all the way through the Old Testament. But they passed on God's messages to the people, so they became God's mouthpieces, God's spokespeople. And, you know, people didn't directly access God's voice for themselves. And you get this scenario back in the Old Testament where Moses says, I wish that everyone could have my spirit and everyone could be prophetic like me. And then you get the Old Covenant covenant prophets looking forward to a new covenant, a time when they wouldn't need to go to someone else to hear from God and they'd have God's spirit written on their hearts. And so I think that Acts 2 is most definitely a fulfillment of that promise and particularly in the light of what Jesus said about sending my spirit to remind you of everything I've spoken and then speak mm -hmm. to you about things to come. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, I think the... Um the, the error here, as I see it, is that you, you believe that the speaking of the Spirit, or the Spirit speaking in prophetic ways or supernatural revelation, is the heart and soul of the New Covenant promise. And I don't think it is the heart and soul of the New Covenant promise. I think that the pouring out of the Spirit on all people is part of the New Covenant promise. That is what distinguishes the New Covenant from the Old. But, that, but you're assuming that the work of the Spirit in every individual person is going to look the same or be the same in terms of what the Spirit the capacities that the Spirit gives to individual believers. So just because the Spirit of God spoke to the Apostle Peter or through the Apostle Paul, or that they were the vehicles of revelation does not necessarily mean, and, and we can't conclude then that that is part and parcel for all believers any more than we can say that the Spirit doing the work of miracles through the Apostles is also something that is the, the, the birthright of every Christian just because they have the Holy Spirit. I may have the Holy Spirit and the, the Apostle Paul may have the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to be a channel of revelation or have apostolic authority as well. So I think that there's a distinction there that needs to be made between the indwelling of the Spirit and the work of the Spirit in what, in, in, in terms of the Spirit's dwelling within every single believer. I agree that the, the new covenant means that the Spirit of God is poured out on all believers, all true repentant believers, but I don't believe that that necessarily then means that we can conclude that every believer then becomes a recipient of divine revelation. You mentioned it would be nice to have a, a didactic teaching that this is what we look for and this is what we see and and something sort of co uh, cookie cutter is the wrong word, but you know a bullet point of what we should be looking for and we, all we have, is, you said what we have is narrative. We do have narrative, but what we see in the narrative is that the Word of God came to apostles and those closely associated with apostolic ministry, and that miracles and signs followed those who were the, the uh, authors of divine revelation and the recipients of divine revelation. But then we do have the epistles, and in the epistles, we are not instructed to look for these things or how to deal with these things at all. So. If the ministry of the Spirit were to give private revelations to everybody, we would expect something in the epistles somewhere that tells us, okay, when this comes, here's how you test it, here's how you know, here's what to look for, here's when you should expect it. But we don't have any of that in the epistles. I mean, just, just, just to jump in there, Jim, I mean, there are obviously those passages in some of Paul's letters where he's talking to a congregation and saying, if someone brings a prophecy, this is what you should do and, and so on. Is that not the equivalent of what you're looking for in the epistles? Yeah, in in some ways it is because we're we're still dealing with a, a a point in time in the early church when I think the revelation was being given through prophets. But as you look at like for instance the Apostle Paul's final epistles when he writes to Timothy, he doesn't say that the the qualities of an elder should include the ability to hear the voice of God or test the spirits uh, in terms of divine revelation. He doesn't point them to further prophets in the church or additional and continuing revelation. Neither does Peter in Second Peter. Instead, they point us back to the written word of God. Paul talks about the inspiration of scripture. Peter refers to the prophetic word, which is more sure than any experience or utterance, even a verbal utterance from heaven. So that is what the apostles pointed us to. And I think that what we see in the early books, like 1 Corinthians, is a recognition that there were revelatory gifts taking place in the first century, in the early church, before scripture was completed and before we had the New Testament books. Now with the completion of the word of God, that type of what What, what makes you so sure, and I will let Tanya come in and ask, but I, just for my own interest, what makes you so sure that, as it were, there is this cutoff point? Because in a sense, is there, is there even a verse in scripture you can point to to say, here and no further with the prophetic gifts and so on um i i guess what's what's your evidence that that we are no longer in that age uh i think that my evidence would be it's, it's a cumulative evidence because you're right there is no specific verse that says there will come a point when miracles will cease but i think what we see in the early church is that miracles were the 
um, were something that was a, a, an attestation. The sign gifts were given to the apostles to authenticate their ministry. Paul talks about the signs of an apostle um, being done among the Corinthians. Um, we don't see that after the first century, the continuation of that. The apostolic office has ceased. Um, and I think that the revelation then of the apostolic writings also ceased with the death of the apostles. And I don't believe that, the, I don't see anything in the New Testament that tells us that that should be going on for the next 2,000 years. T Tanya? Again, I have to come back to Acts chapter 2, sons and daughters, young and old. It's a Hebrew parallelism that's pointing to every demographic that receives the Spirit and therefore the capacity to receive um, Spirit revelation. And then Peter goes on to say that this promise is for you and your children and all who are afar off. Jim, you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, because what you, what you just did was, I think, commit the logical fallacy of saying the promise is that we will receive the Spirit. I would say full stop. And then you said, and the ability then to receive spirit revelation. That's not promised in Acts. What is promised in Acts is the indwelling of the spirit. The, what the promise refers to is the possession of the spirit. Now, the same spirit that is poured out in Acts will in the future give visions and dreams and revelation at the coming millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is what Joel was talking about. And Peter was simply saying the pouring out of the spirit now is the precursor to that. We now have been given the gift of the Spirit and... Okay. Yeah. T Tanya? Uh, and yet, Jim, um, as we trace the, the goings of the early church who are recipients of the Spirit in that moment, we see Holy Spirit speaking to Stephen about his eternity. We see Holy Spirit speaking to Peter about what the church looks like. We see Holy Spirit speaking to the Antiochian leaders about who to send out on mission. We see Holy Spirit speaking to Philip about who to share the good news with. Holy Spirit speaking to Paul about a shipwreck. We see Holy Spirit speaking to Paul about a thorn in his flesh and how to deal with it. We see Holy Spirit speaking to John and the seven churches about how to deal with the pressures of the Greco-Roman Empire. And to your point, I don't think, you know, um, in the epistles, there's a lot of mention specifically of God directly speaking in experience, but that's the backdrop. Acts is the backdrop of Paul and others' writings. And so, I mean, I think David Onne, a, a biblical scholar, has identified 50 or 60 prophecy, mentions prophecy in the New Testament epistles. And even Paul says to Timothy, you know, stay there in keeping with the prophecies made about you. We don't know what the prophecy said. Perhaps it was about his calling in Ephesus. But that spirit experience is the backdrop of the New Testament church. And I think the question then becomes, as we are inheritors of the early church and of the spirit, um, then we would be inheritors of the fullness of the Spirit. And when the canon came, when the scriptures were closed, that's an incredible um, gift to us. Um, but the closing of the canon doesn't stop the Spirit from speaking and working in the same way that the Spirit has always spoken and worked and certainly doesn't stop us from inheriting the fullness of the new covenant, which includes the presence of Jesus walking, talking with us, reminding us of everything Jesus came for, and then speaking to us about applying that into our specific context as we go on Jesus's ministry and mission. So I think, um, I, I, I certainly think it's super true what you say about um, some of the issues around this area, that there's a lot of work to do in terms of understanding our terminology. And I think some of the points that you have raised are really helpful in term, terms of how does the Pentecostal Charismatic Church monitor and regulate these experiences. Many people use God told me as a tool of manipulation and um, a way of compensating for their, their ability to make a good decision, perhaps. Um, it's so many pastoral issues around that, but part of that has come from a theological framework that hasn't really placed this in the New Testament church context and understood hey, if we just fatten, follow the pattern of the New Testament church, we'd be in a much safer place. I mean, if I could stick with you for, for a minute, Tanya, the other area I do want us to press into a bit is the idea of prophecy um, that also obviously figures alongside dreams and visions and so on in the Bible. So have you ever had an experience, uh, someone giving you a prophetic word, which you has then maybe made you do something different to what you would have done otherwise? I I'd just be interested in what your personal experience is on that. Yeah, absolutely. I have found um, that the experience of Peter and Cornelius, like what I was talking about earlier, has happened to me many times. So God has spoken to me um, and then 
someone else has heard from God about the same issue and it's exactly the same word. I remember once living with my flatmate, I would get a dream and she'd get the identical dream and that would answer the question of my dream. There would be a synergy going on, God was speaking twice. And then in my PhD research, I saw that happening time and time again. And I think that's often a part of everyday experience um, that perhaps, Jim, you could relate to, you know, something's on your heart and then, you know, you're in church or you're at a conference and, and someone is speaking that exact same scripture verse or that same thought and it just kind of pierces you. And I think that the Holy Spirit does that on multiple occasions. But um, at the same time, I think that the gift of prophecy and the office of the prophet hasn't often um, been connected directly to the ministry of Jesus. And so we get some problems around that in our times. Yeah, Jim, do you, what's what's your, I mean, when, when Tanya says, I had this experience, I've had this experience multiple times where I, I, do, I believe that God has spoken through someone else confirming something that I was sensing to, again, is it just kind of, you know, subjective? It's just lucky guesses. Do you, do you believe God ever kind of does actually work in that way in, in individuals' lives today? I believe he can, but I, I don't call that revelation again. Um, I believe that the Spirit of God is intimately involved in every aspect of my life. Uh, I believe that he is affecting my thoughts, my mind, my ability to assess truth. He's illuminating me. I think that the Spirit of God is is always involved in every detail of my life. By his by God's providence, the Spirit of God is doing that. So I can sometimes feel it palpably. I can other times it's it's not as not as recognizable to me or evident to me. But just because I don't feel it or sense it doesn't mean that he's not involved. So when I have a question about something or I'm struggling with a decision to make and all of a sudden something happens or someone says something or I read something and I think, okay, this answers it. Now I get clarity here. I don't say the spirit spoke to me and told me. I just chalk that up to divine providence. And I say, by God's providence, this thing unfolded in this way. And I see his hand in it. Sometimes it's extraordinary providence where I think obviously the hand of God is involved in this. I could I could tell you a story about our own church building and how we moved into this church building. It'd take me about 20 or 30 minutes. It would take a whole segment. It is one extraordinary providence and, and incredible providential timing timed event after another. It's it's unbelievable. But I don't I don't call it a miracle. I think miracle is a term that we use far too frequently. I call it divine providence, and I see the hand of God in it. And I see the hand of God on things that, that happen to me and around me all the time. So I have no problem saying that God is active. He is involved. He I, I think he's involved in every single detail of my life. There is not a, a random event, not a random thing at all. It's all under his good and sovereign and wise providential control. I'm just very careful with how I describe that. I don't describe it as the the Spirit speaking to me or uh, Jesus talking to me because I, I call that providence. And I think that providence is a, is a good word. It's, a, it's an idea that we have lost in the church today. And uh, we don't see God's providence enough. Perhaps, Jim, your reticence to say that is um, evidence of a, of, a, of a sound sense of humility. And I think sometimes we need that in the Pentecostal charismatic churches. But at the same time, I think someone like Peter, having just had his vision, he says, God, God has spoken to me not to show favoritism and that the Gentiles are welcome. And then, and Paul says, you know, God's Holy Spirit spoke to me. I had a dream of a man from Macedonia and I did what it said I, was, I wasn't disobedient to the heavenly vision. And they use that word, Philip, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and go to, you know, speak to the Ethiopian on the chariot. So I think that the pattern of using that language comes straight out of scripture itself. But I do think that we do need to have an um, epistemological humility, if you like, about how we talk about our experiences. And perhaps it's more useful to say, I think the Holy Spirit is saying this, what do you think? And we go through a process of testing and perhaps not God isn't speaking as often as we think, um, but I think there should be a humility around it that you are cautioning us with that is really helpful. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I mean, Jim, I, I'm going to give you an example of my own. And, you know, maybe I, I'm showing my colours a little bit here in this debate. <laughs> um, but I, I I recently had a fairly major decision to make and had essentially made the decision. And when that came out to a friend, it, just inadvertently, really, um, they said, oh, I had a dream that this exact thing happened to you, Justin, just last night. Um and I've no reason to disbelieve that that they did. 
And I took that as a sign that this was God saying, this is the right decision. You need, you don't need to worry about this decision. Um, now, is that God? What is that? Is that divine providence? Or is that God confirming something in a direct way to me? What What's your view on that, Jim? I don't know, because I was telling Tanya um, in a minute ago when, when you cut out here for a second, it was just the two of us having a conversation. I told her, one of the problems with experiences is that we, you know, I'm, it's not our job to exegete experiences. People have genuine and serious experiences that are weird and inexplicable, and things happen. And I don't call dreams miraculous. I don't call it revelation. I think that in the moment you, you saw that, the, your friend had a dream, he shared this with you, and you thought, this could be a good thing to do. You, you do it, and it turns out well. By the providence of God, your friend had a dream. Can I exegete meaning into that or use it as a basis for my own experience or teach it as a methodology for others? I don't think that that's appropriate. Um, so I have and, had and experiences yet, of yet, extraordinary providences that have yet, worked the, out well. The early church mm. did that, though. Well, the apostles did that. Well, all, all the examples that you gave me are of apostles yeah. receiving divine revelation, and they yes. were certain of it. Yes. But we don't have the apostles teaching the rest of us that we should be expecting that. But we, that shouldn't that we the follow law. their lead? Shouldn't we, as, 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 as apostolic leaders in the church, shouldn't we follow the pattern that the Holy Spirit and their leadership set for us in Scripture? Shouldn't we anticipate that same pattern in our lives? No, I don't think we should anticipate it. I don't think that we're told that we should expect it. And, and I deal with that assumption in my book that we should expect this kind of revelation. I don't think scripture teaches that the average Christian should expect it. I believe that scripture teaches that it happened with apostles and prophets in the early church and prophets and certain you know kings and leaders in the Old Testament as well. But it does not teach that that is the lot for every believer. So it would be wrong for me to teach other people that they should also expect this or even that they need it. Because I think to suggest that they need such a thing to make a decision is to suggest that scripture is not sufficient. So to answer Justin's question regarding uh, Justin, your experience, if I were to tell you that's a great experience, you should start having seminars where you teach other people how to make decisions on the basis of dreams. <laughs> I, I think you've overstepped the bounds or to teach people that they sure. need to have some sort of confirmation like that to make a decision is to suggest that scripture is not sufficient. And I, I think that's where we get into bad theological error. Why why do do you believe, Tanya, that scripture hasn't, you know, that, that we, we should be following the model of the apostles today, um, that, that it's not over for us? One of the things that you highlighted, Jim, in your book was this incredible emphasis on decision making in this area. In fact, most of the teaching on hearing God's voice is about making decisions and guidance and yeah. God, what do you want for my life? And, and here again, what we've done is we've disconnected the work of the spirit from Jesus, who said that my spirit will come and continue what I've started. So what does discipleship look like under the new covenant? It looks like I hear the voice of God and I follow it. And so when we think about hearing the voice of of God, we need to broaden that out into discipleship, sanctification, the whole relationship that we have. Uh, um, these days, people are more expectant to hear God say, you know, I'm going to give you a red Ferrari rather than tell you to wash the dishes for your spouse. But the Spirit speaks as the continuing voice of Jesus. And Jesus said, take up your cross and follow. So we can expect that the Spirit is going to speak to sons and daughters, young and old, about becoming a disciple, about being transformed. I um, I know a guy on the on the, in the South Island of New Zealand, and God spoke to him about making the bed. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, no, I don't make the bed. My wife makes the, the bed. But eventually he acquiesced and started making the bed. And then a year later, he'd been making the bed for a year. A year later, God speaks to him and says, Brian, I want you to lead the church. And as he did that, and as he began to lead the church, miracles and um, salvations began to break out in the town. And I often think about that understanding of hearing God's voice as a really helpful way to understand that spirit speaks as Jesus, calling us to follow, calling us to become like Jesus, calling up to take up our cross, to do things we don't want to do so that our sin and selfishness is nailed to death and so that we can experience re resurrection life flowing in and through us. And as you pointed out so beautifully, I think that that, that 
that idea, that concept, that frame of reference for hearing the Spirit has been lost. And people have come to understand, you know, hearing God's voice looks like, I hear what I want to hear. <laughs> it'll fit with my dreams. It'll fit with my desires. I'm going to dream big. You know, I've got a vision for my life. Well, actually, God's vision for your life is to follow Jesus. And that continues your sons, your daughters, you, this generation, the one after it, to, to peoples beyond Jerusalem. This is not just for you, it's for everyone, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We'll, we'll go to a quick break and we'll we'll come back to you, Jim. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to talk in the final segment really about, obviously, you know, you both have your different perspectives on this, but but what difference it makes, um, what, what you feel you would lose without this aspect of the experiences as you see it tanya of the the spirit speaking to you what 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 jim why you don't think it would add anything to have that why you think actually what you the the life you live is not in some sense dry or purely you know you know some lived in the head or anything like that um just because you obviously don't take the same view as tanya so we'll come to that um we're talking about whether god speaks today through dreams visions prophecy and other ways uh my guest today tanya harris and jim osman for more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter. Well, it's been a really fascinating discussion today on dreams, visions and prophecy, a cessationist perspective being brought to us by Jim Osman, author of God Doesn't Whisper. If you want more from Jim, the website is jimosman.com. There's a link with today's show. Tanya Harris is the founding director of God Conversations. She has a book of that name as well as The Church Who Hears God's Voice. If you want more from Tanya, godconversations.com. Um, so, Jim, I think you had a question for, for Tanya as we get into this final segment. Yeah, you mentioned in, in the last segment that, um, that you're really applying this paradigm to discipleship, sanctification, life of the church. And so my question would be, do you think that Scripture is sufficient to equip you for those works of sanctifying and discipling people, or is something more necessary? And, and here I think it's super helpful to go back to the words of Jesus when he said, I'm going to send the Spirit. And the categories that he used is that, that the Spirit will remind us of what Jesus has established. And then because Jesus had so much more to say and he, the disciples couldn't handle it all at once, that Jesus would then speak about things to come through the Spirit. And um, so what we see here is that the Spirit is... God's strategy to call people into ministry, mission, into salvation. And so the Spirit is calling us to remember the gospel, which is now reliably, reliably recorded for us as scripture. But it's the Spirit that then takes those truths and apply them. So I think a, perhaps a better way of describing that is that the Spirit is the one that helps us to do that. And so, for example, I think about a university professor who reads the Bible as ancient literature and just reads it as a text. What we want to see is the spirit working and speaking through scripture to speak to that man. So I think um, perhaps some of those categories are not going to help us. Obviously, the boundaries have been set very, very clearly by scripture, by Jesus as he came, and nothing would change that. The Mormon church went outside of that when Joseph Smith made claims that extra that added to Jesus. And I think those boundaries are very, very clear in scripture. But when we have a look at the pattern of scripture, we see that the spirit is continually applying those truths of Jesus into different contexts. And I think perhaps that language is a bit more helpful for us. So the short answer is no then? The short answer is scripture is sufficient for the conditions of salvation, absolutely, and for the parameters of Jesus, absolutely. But if you did not have personal revelation as you see it, then you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to rely upon Scripture and Scripture alone for the sanctification of God's people, the teaching, instruction, and righteousness, etc. Let me give you an example. When I first started hearing God's voice, God spoke to me about my life and he said that the way this is going to happen in ministry is that in this church that you're in, you are going to be raised up in leadership. You're going to be mentored by the pastor. You're going to work here one day a week at the church. And I said to myself, how is that going to happen? Um, I'm new in this church. I don't know the leadership. And I, I remember thinking, okay, God. And a couple of weeks later, the, the 
the pastor came up to me and she said, Tanya, God has spoken to me. He's asked me to mentor you. I'm going to raise you up in leadership here. And he's asked me to invite you to work here one day a week at the church. And I, I remember reflecting on that and how much before I knew that God has good plans for us, plans to prosper us and not to harm us, plans to give us a hope and a future. But now I had seen that God had good plans for me plans to prosper me, to give me a hope and a future. And so what had become, what was truth in scripture now became alive to me. And that was a work of the spirit. And obviously it's a very definable, identifiable example, but I think that's the difference, that the spirit that Jesus gave to continue the work that he began is the one that brings us into revelation. And revelation comes as we choose to follow God and we have eyes of our heart that are open to receiving it. Yeah, I think this is a clear distinction um, that I believe the scripture is completely sufficient for all of life and godliness. And we've been given everything we need in the 66 books of scripture for church leadership, for church structure, to answer questions in life, to make decisions, to sanctify us. The spirit of God uses that word and the preaching of that word and our study and memorizing of that word. And the more that we know the word to accomplish all of those things. And, and we don't need anything outside of that because scripture itself is entirely sufficient for everything God's given us to do. I can imagine, you know, some critics of your approach, Jim, saying you're one of the frozen chosen. You know, you're you're very sort of, you know, it's this way and and it's it's just about reading the Bible. And, and maybe they just feel that feels like a very dry, formal way of doing life, doing Christianity. Um, and, and they like the, the, the fact that, you know, in, in Tanya's view, there's this kind of dynamic relationship almost with God where where there's a sort of conversation, you know, which is, you know, the name of Tanya's ministry. So, OK, what's wrong with that characterization of, of the way that you kind of yourself have a, have that kind of nature and relationship with God? Yeah, I, maybe part of that is my personality, but I would not, not characterize my relationship with God as stagnant or dry or heady at all. I speak to God in prayer and he speaks to me through his word. And every morning I wake up and I read scripture. I read through the Bible at once a year and other books multiple times a year. I study scripture you know, all day long while I'm preparing for sermons on Sunday. My heart rejoices in the text of scripture. And right now I'm studying Hebrews 12. And as I see truth uh, uh, pop out of me on the pages of scripture, I put together the connections and the context. My heart is thrilled. My heart is lifted in praise. Sometimes I just find myself bowing my head and thanking God and praying about things that I'm seeing in the Word of God. So I have a very vibrant relationship with the Lord and that sometimes is more emotional than at other times. And I believe that He speaks to me through His Word. And when I understand what Scripture says, the meaning of the Holy Spirit in the passage of Scripture, I'm hearing the voice of God in that passage, in that text of Scripture, through the meaning of the passage. Um, so I, I have a... that. I understand the concern that people have. They they think that if you're not hearing an audible voice, that it's a one way conversation. This is you know from my book that this is how many people in the in the hearing the voice of God movement characterize my position that there's no conversation. I don't know how you I don't know what as if God never speaks and I don't know what you those people think Scripture is. I think it's the Word of God. It's living. It's powerful. It's sharper than a two edged sword. It's beautiful. It's the source of truth and wisdom and beauty and delight. It's the revelation of who God is, His nature, His redeeming plans, the future, the past, um, His His character, His truth, His love, His grace. All of that is all given to us in Scripture. It is it is filled with truth about God. So how one could feel like reading Scripture just leaves them without any voice from heaven? I, I don't understand that perspective mm. at all. And, and and I'm sure you love the way that that, that Jim puts that, Tanya. You're you're nodding along to the, obviously yeah, the joy. Yeah, well, that's the spirit that, that at work. That's the spirit at work. And you know, I yeah. think again back to Jesus. Now, now, if I had been Jesus, I would have done it really differently. I would have said, now when I leave. I'm going to send you my spirit. But before I do, I'm going to give you every instruction that you will ever need for your life. And I'm going to get a scribe and he's going to write it all down in a book. <laughs> and then I'm going to get you to download that book. And then I have nothing else to say or nothing new to say. Um, and I often think, Jesus, you, you chose a risky path by relying on your spirit to bring revelation to our hearts. And of course, God speaks through this, the revelation of Jesus in scripture, of course. And that's a dynamic conversation as much as any way, anyone. But I do think that the pattern of the New Testament church shows us that the spirit speaks specifically into our context and making those truths come alive in our, in our specific situations. And um, that we follow the pattern of scripture when we anticipate that.
and obviously you believe ultimately that your life and the lives of many others have been enriched by discovering that i guess tanya um it's not something i don't think you you would find it difficult to to kind of live life the way that jim lives in terms of it, it purely being something that is is comes through the pages of scripture alone the, that that kind of revelation um i've had both and um i feel for me that the my relationship with god um, I, I was, I'm a skeptic by nature and I wanted to see the tangible evidence, the direct intervention of Holy Spirit in my life and I have seen that um, in particular ways, again, that align itself to the way that God has shown himself to people in, in Scripture. So that for me has yeah changed everything. I think perhaps it has um, called me beyond myself and I've seen miracles and things that I could never have anticipated or imagined for myself. So I think that element has been very strong with me. Mm. F- final thoughts as we close out today's show. Jim, do you want to go first? Uh, no, I would just want to, well, yeah, yes, I'll go first, I guess. <laughs> uh, I would just want to encourage the listener to that to, to realize the scripture is sufficient for all of life and godliness. And I don't believe that we need anything more. I, I think that we get into a subjective realm that is, um, you know, Tanya says it's risky and it is, and it's, it's fraught with danger and disillusionment and deception. I think people claim to hear from God uh, who, who are not hearing from God. And you made a statement in your book, Tanya, that I think was, was very good. I said it in my book as well. When you claim to hear from God and you're not, you're putting words in God's mouth. And you can run the risk of misrepresenting God when you say God has spoken and he has not said something. And you and I would hate to be misrepresented. And I think that the God of all the universe, who is holy and just and righteous and and infinite in all of his qualities, also takes offense at being misrepresented. And I think that's the danger of thinking that you can speak for God or that you've you've heard heard God's voice. And to say that uh, we should expect to hear from God outside of Scripture, I think, is to go beyond what is written. Tanya, final thought? Um, I don't believe that scripture is an obstacle to the spirit speaking and working and that we are inheritors of the new covenant as Peter outlined in Acts chapter 2. Sons and daughters, young and old, can hear from God in the same way as the old covenant prophets. And I encourage people to choose to follow Jesus, the spirit of Jesus, continually speaking, calling them to take up their cross and follow and then going out on the mission of God to make a difference in our world. Well, thank you both. And thanks for the for the grace that you've conducted the conversation in um, and obviously very different perspectives on this issue. But I'm so glad to be able to bring you both together and, and have a substantive conversation on it. Uh, Jim and Tanya, thank you. Um, Godconversations.com for more from Tanya. JimOsman.com for more from Jim. The links are with today's show. But for now, thank you both. And uh, yeah. I'll thank see you, later. you, Jim. Thank you, Justin. Thank, thank you both. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.